The impulse response of a discrete time, linear time invariant system completely characterizes the system. We've been doing examples where we've been computing the convolution of the impulse response with an input to yield the output. What we're going to do now is we're going to examine system properties and show how these system properties are related to the impulse response. In some ways, this is kind of similar to what we did with signals. Early on, we looked at signals and we learned how to classify signals. If you were given a signal, you could tell me things about it, whether it was continuous or discrete time, if it was random or deterministic, if it was a power signal or an energy signal. We learned how to classify signals by looking at the signal. So this is similar, but for systems. Given the impulse response of a discrete time, linear time invariant system, we're going to be able to tell things about that system by just examining the impulse response. One of the ways that we can classify a system is if it's memoryless or not. The definition of a memoryless LTI system is that the output, y of k, only depends on the current input. So we know that the output of a discrete time LTI system is related to the input via convolution. And this right here is what we call the convolution sum. If instead of writing it compactly as this infinite sum, I actually write out all the terms, so dot 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 plus this term plus the next term plus h of 0 times x of k plus this term and then on, on forever, I can, I can see which, I can see how the output is related to the impulse response values and also the input signal values. So if I analyze this, what I can see is if that if I want to be memoryless, the output can only depend on the current input. Well, if my output is at time k, the current input is x of k. So out of all these terms over here on the right, the only one is, that is the current input is this value right here. So if I'm going to be memoryless, all these other values have to go away. So what that means is that every term in this expansion that we just wrote out has to be zero except for h of 0 times x of k. So based on that observation, we can define now a little bit more carefully in terms of the impulse response what it means for a discrete time linear time invariant system to be memoryless. A discrete time LTI system is memoryless if and only if the impulse response is equal to some impulse at time 0 times c. So if you're dealing with a memoryless system, its impulse response is really simple. It's just a single impulse at the origin with some arbitrary constant c. If it's anything other than this, then it is not a memoryless system. So determining if something is memoryless or not is very simple. If it's an impulse, it is. If it's anything except that, it's not. Another way that we classify linear time invariant systems is whether they are causal or not. A causal system is one that depends on only the past or present inputs. So causal systems make sense. They only react based on what's happening right now or what happened to them in the past. They don't react based on things in the future. If they were able to react based on things that were going to happen in the future, that would just be a very strange situation. So again, let's look at our discrete time convolution written out in this very expanded form. And we can identify again the present input, x of k, and we can also see the past inputs, x of k minus 1, x of k minus 2, etc. So these terms right here are the past and present inputs. Future inputs are x of k plus 1, x of k plus 2, etc. So if I am a causal system, I cannot have these terms right here. So if I'm a causal system, those terms can't exist, which means that this has to be 0, and h at minus 2 has to be 0, and h at minus 3 has to be 0, etc. A causal LTI system has non-zero values in its impulse response only for time 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Nothing for negative time. So more formally, we write our definition like this. A causal discrete time system has an impulse response that is 0 for all negative time. And like I said before, these types of systems are the one we deal with in the real world. They make sense. They don't output anything before an impulse is applied. If they were able to react before we put something in, that would just be a strange situation. Another way of saying that is causal systems are realizable, meaning we can actually build a causal system. We can't build a non-causal system. 
Another way to classify systems is whether they are stable or not. There are different ways to define stability. There's what we call bounded input, bounded output stable. That's what we're talking about right now. There's also um, marginally stable and, and some other ways that you can classify a system as stable or not. We're going to focus on this BIBO stable. What it means to be BIBO stable is that my output is bounded for every bounded input. So I am a BIBO system, BIBO stable system. If for every bounded input that you give me, I give you a bounded output. Mathematically, we write it like this. To talk about having a bounded input, we say that the magnitude of the input, this is the magnitude of the input, is less than some number, and that number is less than infinity, it's bounded. I am BIBO stable if this is satisfied, then this is satisfied. So when I'm BIBO stable, for every bounded input, my output is also bounded. So right here all we've done is written that the output, the magnitude of it, is less than some number, which is less than infinity. This number could be big, it could be 1e to the 6, but that's still bounded. If m sub y was actually equal to y to the 6, I'm sorry, 1e to the 6, then the magnitude would still be less than a finite number, which is less than infinity. So what we need to do is, this is this is our BIBO stability kind of in words. If this is true, then this is true when I'm dealing with a BIBO stable system. What we need to come up with is a condition on H. We would like to be able to figure out, is this system BIBO stable just by looking at H? To come up with this condition, we're going to use two facts. One of them is this fact right here. It says that the magnitude of a sum is less than or equal to a sum of magnitudes. This is also called the triangle inequality. So that's one fact we're going to use. The other fact is this one. This one's very obvious. The magnitude of a product is the product of the magnitudes. So with those two facts, we can actually develop a condition for h of k that tells you if a system is bibostable or not. So first, let's just compute the magnitude of y of k. We know that y of k is equal to the convolution of x of k which with the impulse response. And I've taken the magnitude here because we're trying to compute the magnitude of this quantity. Well, this is really just shorthand for this infinite sum. So the sum from m equals minus infinity to infinity of h of m x of k minus m. And I just realized that sum there should not be a sum over k, it should really be a sum over m. Okay, so the sum from m equals minus infinity to infinity h of m x of k minus m. So what we're going to do is we are going to use the fact from the previous page to bound this. So the magnitude of y of k is actually equal to this. This right here is a magnitude of a sum. Using the triangle inequality, we can upper bound it and write it as a sum of magnitudes. So this is the triangle inequality that we had on the previous chart. So the magnitude of y of k is upper bounded by this. The fact that we have on the previous page said that the magnitude of a product is equal to the product of magnitude. So I have replaced this magnitude of a product, which is the magnitude of this times the magnitude of this. So that's just a fact, that's an, and that's an equality, so we have an equals there. And now I'm going to use the fact, or assume, that we have a bounded input. So if I have a bounded input, this part right here, is always less than some number. So there's some, some number, m sub x, that this is always less than. So I can upper bound again, I can make this quantity go bigger by replacing the magnitude of x of k minus m with a number that's always greater than or equal to the magnitude of x of k minus m. This value right here, I could have had it inside the sum, but it's not a function of m, so it's just a constant, so it got pulled outside the sum. So I'm left with this. So the magnitude of y of k is less than or equal to some number times the sum of the absolute value of my impulse response. So, so far I've assumed that if my input is bounded, then y of k is bounded by this quantity. If I want this to be less than infinity, so if I want this to be less than infinity, then what I need is for this to be less than infinity. And that's the exact criteria that we'll write down here on the following chart. So a linear time invariant system is bounded input, bounded output stable, as long as my impulse response satisfies this equation. 
This equation says that if I take the absolute value of my impulse response and sum it up, I get a number less than infinity. Another way of saying this is that my impulse response is absolutely summable. Absolutely summable means exactly this. I can take the absolute value of something, sum it over all time, and get a number that converges. I get a number out, not infinity. So that's what we mean by bibostable, and we now have a way to check if a system is bibostable simply by examining its impulse response. I mentioned this uh, just a minute ago. Bibostable is just one type of stability. We can also talk about asymptotically stable. We can talk about things being unstable. We can talk about systems being marginally stable. And we'll get into some of these concepts and some of the problems. These concepts of stability all have to do with the location of the characteristic roots. So we've talked a lot about difference equations. We looked at characteristic equations, solving for the characteristic modes, those roots. And another way of defining system stability is based on the location of those roots. If all of the roots are inside the unit circle, have a magnitude less than one, that's asymptotically stable. If any of them are outside or have a magnitude greater than one, then it's unstable. And if they have a magnitude of one, then that's what we call marginally stable. So another way of doing stability is by examining the location of the characteristic roots of the uh, characteristic equation of the system. Some systems are invertible. So if you are in an invertible LTI system, you have an input that can be recovered exactly from the output. The process of doing this is what's called deconvolution. So deconvolution is the opposite of convolution. So another way of thinking of it is deconvolution undoes convolution. And when you go through the process of getting x of k out of this convolution quantity, that is called deconvolution. So inverse systems perform deconvolution. And the impulse response of an inverse system, sometimes we write as h inv. So this implies that h inv of k is the impulse response of a system that undoes what the original system with impulse response h of k did. Not all systems are invertible, but some are. If you stack up the original system and the inverse system, put them in cascade, put them in a line together, then they completely cancel each other out. It turns out that x of k convolved with this convolution, so put it through system 1, then put it through the inverse system, what you get out is what you started with, because that's exactly what an inverse system should do. If this equation is going to be true, this means that the inverse impulse response, the impulse response of my inverse system, when convolved with the impulse response of my original system, this needs to turn into a delta function, because the only way that I can get x back when I convolve it with something is if this something is an impulse. If x convolved with impulse, that is x. So this has to be the impulse function. So if I have h of k, if I wanted to know what the inverse system is, this equation right here tells me how to solve for, for the inverse system impulse response. We've talked a lot about the impulse response of a discrete time linear time invariant system. Another thing I wanted to mention just briefly is the step response. And the step response is similar. It's the output of an LTI system that's at rest, but it's the output when you put in a step function. It turns out that the step response and the impulse response are related. So here is what happened. Here is the step response. The step response is the output of my system when I put in a step. So this, by definition, is the step response. And I can write out what this discrete time convolution is. Instead of using the symbol star, we can actually just write out what this convolution is. Looking at this though, note that this u of k minus m is zero for all values of m greater than k. So lots of these higher order terms turn off. Also, for the values where this is not zero, it's equal to one. So in reality, this sum right here collapses into this nice sum right here. So we have that the step response is really just a summation of the impulse response. So the impulse response and the step response have a nice simple relationship via this equation. So if I know what the impulse response of my system is, I can easily calculate what the step response is just by doing a summation. Similarly, we can 
compute what the impulse response is given the step response by differencing. So just like integration and differentiation cancel each other out, in the discrete world, summation and differencing cancel each other out. So in the previous chart, we had that the step response was equal to a summation of h. Well, to undo that, I would say that h is equal to a differencing of s. So that's exactly what we have written right here. So the impulse response is equal to a difference of the step response. So if you knew what the step response is, or was, you could easily compute what the impulse response is just by taking a difference.